Good evening, and thank you all for coming to the uh, California Initiative Forum. This forum is presented by the students in Dr. Garrick Percival's Senior Seminar on Punishment of Politics. Politics of Punishment students in Dr. Mary Karen Percival's Political Participation Course and the Mid-Peninsula Community Media Center. It is also sponsored in by the Knight Foundation. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the Mid-Peninsula Community Center a website. It will also be posted on the League of Women Voters website and will also be posted on YouTube in an effort to provide information about these important issues on the, on the California initiatives. Today we will cover three of the 17 initiatives on the California ballot, Proposition 62, Proposition 63, and Proposition 66. We will begin with the discussion on Proposition 63, where our moderator, Jay, where our moderator Jay Tanner, will introduce the speakers and explain the format. Thank you. Okay, first of all, um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we'd like to acknowledge a few groups that helped put this together before we begin. Um, first, we'd like to thank Elliot Margulies of the Mid Peninsula Community Media Center for helping orchestrate this. Also, the SJSU Political Science Department, especially our department chair, Melinda Jackson, as well as SJSU Student Services, uh, Student Union Event Services, I'm sorry, and uh, Dr. Garrick Percival and Dr. Mary Curran Percival for helping us students organize this. Um, I would also like to thank my class, uh, Political Science 108, Political Participation, for helping get ready for talking about Prop 63. Uh, with all that said, let's get into it. So Prop 63 is also known as the Safety for All Act of 2016. And today we have uh, Mr. Jeff Rosen, the Santa Clara District, uh, County District Attorney for the Yes on 63 side, and Mr. Sean Brady, attorney at Michael and Associates and member of the Coalition for Civil Liberties for No on 63. Um, just a few rules about our forum. Each speaker will be given five minutes to present their side and then five minutes for rebuttal. And after those presentations, we will open up the uh, forum to questions from the audience. We're trying to get as many questions as possible. So uh, each speaker will have 90 seconds to answer the question, uh, each question from the audience. And we will try to get through as many as possible. So write down your questions as soon as you have them. Um, Helen and Lena, over here, we'll be passing out note cards. Uh, so feel free to write your questions down on those note cards and give them to those girls as you come up with them. Uh, with that, Mr. Rosen is going to be speaking first, and let's get started. Good evening. Whether you are young, middle-aged, or mature, you should support Prop 63. Whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, you should support Prop 63. Whether you love guns, hate guns, grew up with guns, or never fired a gun, you should support Prop 63. Here's why. Today, felons, the mentally ill, and other prohibited, prohibited persons mostly domestic violence abusers, can easily and lawfully purchase ammunition without any background check. Proposition 63 fixes that loophole and requires background checks for all ammunition purchases, which is crucial. After all, bullets is what makes guns lethal. Number two. Today, commercial ammunition sellers don't have to be licensed by the California Department of Justice. Proposition 63 closes that loophole and requires licensing. Number three, today individuals can buy large capacity magazines carrying dozens of bullets. These large capacity magazines have been used in mass shootings to kill hundreds of innocent people in our country. Large capacity magazines have no legitimate non-military purpose. 
Proposition 63 bans dangerous large capacity magazines. Today, if a gun is lost or stolen, the owner doesn't have to report that to the police. Proposition 63 requires the reporting of lost or stolen guns, which help ensure that guns don't end up in the hands of the wrong people, of criminals. Number five, today an individual can steal a gun and it's lawful for that person to buy a gun. Proposition 63 closes that loophole by making it a felony for stealing a gun, which would then prohibit that person from buying a gun. And finally, today it can be very difficult to know whether felons, the mentally ill, or other prohibited persons like domestic violence abusers have turned in their guns. Proposition 63 fixes that problem and sets up a system to document and enforce the removal of guns from these dangerous individuals, which will ensure more safety for all of us. It's too easy to buy ammunition. Every five minutes in this country, someone is shot. Think about that. During the time I've been speaking, someone in the United States has been shot with a gun. And when the person speaking against Proposition 63 finishes speaking, another person in the United States will have been shot by a gun. Vote for reasonable and pragmatic laws that will make us safer. Vote for Prop 63. Thank you. Good evening. I generally enjoy uh, having a, a debate over uh, the efficacy of gun control and talking about how it doesn't work to make people safer and it in fact only really burdens the law abiding and particularly poor people. But the reality is we don't have to engage in that debate here over Proposition 63. Even those who support gun control generally should oppose Proposition 63. There's a few reasons why. First, it's not necessary. If you like the idea of banning the possession of over 10 round magazines, well, good news for you. The legislature just passed a law and the governor signed it. Those magazines will be prohibited on July 1st. If you agree with the idea that ammunition vendors should be licensed and that ammunition purchasers should undergo background checks, again, good news for you. The legislature passed a law that does that and the governor just signed it. So you don't need Proposition 63 to put these gun control bills into place, these gun control laws into place. It's unnecessary. But it's not just that it's redundant of current law. It would actually replace these current laws that were carefully crafted by lawmakers, the legislature, whose job it is to make laws, with the help of stakeholders, particularly law enforcement. So this is a job better done by the legislature. And that's not just me saying this. It's not just the pro-gun rights crowd saying this. This is. Democratic Senator Kevin DeLeon, who has authored several gun control laws, including the recent ammunition registration bill that is in jeopardy by Proposition 63. He urged the proponents of Proposition 63 to remove it from the ballot for that particular reason. Former Democratic Mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Viragosa, expressed similar concerns. And more importantly, just today, the California Police Chiefs Association in the LA Times and the Sacramento Bee announced that they oppose Proposition 63 for the same reasons. And it's critical to understand here that the California Police Chiefs Association supports ammunition background checks. They helped draft the law that is now in jeopardy and they oppose Proposition 63. This is not about gun control, it's about the specifics of this particular provision which is 43 pages long. I'm sorry, 34. Mixed, 34 pages long. What business do people have voting on 34 pages of convoluted laws when lawmakers, law enforcement, and others are saying, please don't, you're jeopardizing our laws? Who do you trust more, law enforcement and lawmakers or politicians who are running for governor and want to make a name for themselves? The California Police Chiefs Association is not the only law enforcement who's announced their opposition to Proposition 63. Every single law enforcement group to date who has spoken on the issue opposes. 
California State Sheriff's Association, California Reserve Peace Officers Association. So uh, not a single law enforcement group has come out and supported Proposition 63. It is critical to also understand how initiatives work. This would cement these laws into place. It would not only replace the laws that are currently in place, it would cement them in place so that they cannot be fixed or amended or repealed if necessary. The state of New York actually passed an almost identical ammunition provision to what's being proposed in Proposition 63. And Governor Cuomo, not exactly uh, on the NRA's Christmas card list, decided to with not implement the ammunition uh, provision because he realized it would be too costly and burdensome. What if that happens here? We don't have the option to uh, say, hold on, let's stop and reevaluate whether this system's working. Proposition 63 shoves it down our throats. And that's the problem with doing laws by proposition. It's the same with uh, the system to remove firearms from those who are prohibited. I think everyone generally supports that notion. But you have to be careful. The, leg the legislative analyst office said that it would cost tens of millions of dollars to do this system. The courts were not asked if this system is appropriate. Lawyers were not asked. It's just going to be shoved down their throats. The duty to report law, the go Governor Brown vetoed this law twice, saying nobody's not reporting their laws. It's a useless, feel-good law. And finally, Proposition 47, making it uh, uh, the, the, making it back into a felony for the theft of a handgun or for a firearm, should show everybody exactly the type of unintended consequences that happen when you pass a proposition. That was a result of Proposition 47, making it from a felony to a misdemeanor. Now we need a proposition to go back. How many unintended consequences are in 34 pages of laws that we're going to have to do more propositions to fix? And it's only the most ardent. Sorry, Mr. Brady, we've reached our time limit for your side. Sure. Thank you. Okay. We are now going to open up the floor to student questions. I'm sorry. No, Mr. Rosen, you uh, have an option to rebuttal. Speak. Five minutes or what? Yes, five minutes. Let me introduce myself. I'm the chief law enforcement officer of this county. I'm the district attorney. And my responsibility as the district attorney is to vigorously pursue justice in a way that's fair and treats everyone equally and with respect. So when the opponents of this proposition say that there's no law enforcement support, um, the district attorneys, the elected district attorneys in the Bay Area, whose job it is to protect you day in and day out, support Proposition 63 because it will help us get guns out of the hands of criminals. It's as simple as that. We prosecute in our county 40,000 criminal cases a year. We have hundreds of cases of domestic violence a year. In those situations, we ask the court to order the defendant to give us his firearms. But we don't have laws in place which make it easy for us to do this. And Proposition 63 will help us remove guns from domestic violence abusers, from the mentally ill, and from convicted felons who have no business in owning a handgun to begin with. Now, once an initiative is passed, it's not true that the legislature cannot make amendments to further the spirit of that legislation. So if there are unintended consequences, as has been suggested, the legislature can pass amendments to further support the purpose of this legislation. And the purpose of this legislation, let's just be very clear, is to remove guns from the hands of criminals, to make it unlawful for individuals who are prohibited from buying ammunition to do that, and to set up a system to be able to enforce those laws. And that's why I, as the chief law enforcement officer of this county, who's charged with protecting the safety and well-being of every person in this room, supports this legislation. With all due respect to Mr. District Attorney and uh, his efforts to promote public safety, and I don't doubt that he does and, and genuinely believes in this, he is alone in that sentiment. 
There are 58 DAs in this state. Maybe three have come out in support of Proposition 63. The Los Angeles Deputy District Attorneys Association has opposed. The California State Sheriff's Association has opposed. The California Police Chiefs Association has opposed. The California Reserve Peace Officers Association opposed. California Gay Warns Association opposed. Western State Sheriff's Association opposed. I can go on, I won't bore you. Uh, not a single, and I never said there's no law enforcement support. Obviously, I know what a DA is. I said there is not a single law enforcement group, and there isn't, and there are several that oppose. So while I respect uh, Mr. DA's uh, uh, position on this, you have to take it into context that he's a, he's a lone voice on this in the law enforcement community. I would much rather take the word of police, law enforcement, who are out actually out on the street doing these laws, uh, implementing, enforcing these laws, than I would, uh, a, a quite frankly, a politician uh, who has to get elected to office in order to, uh, to have his position. Um, another point, I, I never said that the legislature cannot amend the law at all. It can to further the purpose. But what does that mean? We don't know what further the purpose means. What if, as the California Police Chiefs Association has stated in its letter, that it wants certain exceptions for, say, cadets who are going through the police academy to be able to have uh, large capacity magazines? Currently, they can't. And the California Police Chiefs Association wants them to. Can't fix, can't change that. Does that, does making exception, additional exceptions further the, the, uh, the purpose of that uh, law? I don't know. You don't know. It's a vague term. That's why, again, we are here in this situation with Prop 47. Why couldn't we just fix Prop 47 and, and make a firearm, a, uh, the theft of a firearm a felony again instead of a misdemeanor? So I think it's critical to understand just because you generally support gun control doesn't mean you have to support, blindly support all gun control. I support zoning laws, but I would evaluate every zoning law to make, it, make sure it's not something outrageous that says, you know, you can't have a potted plant or, or, or you're going to prison or something, right? You, ha you have to use critical thought and don't take my word for it, right? I'm the pro-gun guy that, you know, if, if you're pro-gun uh, gun control, you don't have to listen to me. Listen to the California State Sheriff's Association, the California Police Chiefs Association, law enforcement, those who are enforcing these laws. You know, the, Mr. DA is saying that these are critical law enforcement tools. Well, apparently law enforcement doesn't want them. Shouldn't we be asking those who implement this stuff? And with respect to the, the system to remove firearms from prohibited persons, again, we have to understand this is cemented in place. Yes, they can make uh, little tweaks to it if it furthers the purpose, but how do we know that we're gonna be able to change uh, the, the system that the courts are forced to implement? Wh wh why is it a good idea for all of us who have no idea, including myself as a lawyer, uh, how the court systems operate behind the scenes to tell them and to tell probation officers how they should be doing their job, giving them no voice and risking that they will have to come back and fix it with an expensive proposition, especially a system that comes with a price tag of tens of millions of dollars annually. This is why law enforcement has written the ballot opposition, the opposition that appears on the ballot is written by law enforcement, and it says that this does not only make us safer, it, uh, it negatively impacts public safety by diverting crucial resources away from law enforcement to these feel-good, meaningless laws. That's not my words, that's law enforcement. The, uh, the Liberal Gun Club of California also pointed out that this money could be going to programs to promote youth, to stay out of violence. Those, those millions of dollars are much better used for those two purposes that I just indicated. You should vote no on Prop 63. There's no reason that we should be voting on 34 pages of complex laws. Only the most ardent supporters of Gavin Newsom support this. Nobody else does. Thank you. Now we're going to open the floor to student questions. Okay. All right. 
first uh, from the audience, we have a question that says, why do neither of you, Mr. Rosen or Mr. Brady, address the banning of manufacturing weapons for public purchasing? Mr. Rosen, if you'd like to start. I think I, I think I understand what the question is saying. I think the question is saying that uh, that we should ban the manufacture of of all weapons, including guns. Uh, that may be a point of view that some people hold, but the Second Amendment to the Constitution allows individuals the the right to uh, own firearms to protect themselves. Uh, the courts have also held that that right is subject to reasonable regulation. And I think that Prop 63 is an example of that kind of reasonable regulation in the sense of certain persons should not be allowed to own or purchase ammunition. And the kind of uh, the size of magazines uh, should be limited so as not to allow for mass killings. So I think the answer to the question is that the Constitution allows for the purchase and the sale of handguns. Um, I didn't address it because it's not addressed by Proposition 63, which is primarily relates to ammo and magazines, not really manufacturing. And just to make clear, though, I think the manufacturing aspect raises a point that I believe uh, that Mr. Rosen misspoke by saying that people can go and purchase uh, large capacity magazines. The, the, the sale, manufacturing, importation of large capacity magazines has been illegal in California since 2000. These magazines, that are, they're now wanting to ban the possession of these magazines. Anybody who currently has one of these magazines means that they've had it lawfully and have done nothing wrong with them for over 16 years. And that's getting into the debate over the efficacy of gun control laws, uh, which I, again, don't really think we need to get into with Prop 63 because it doesn't, uh, you know, it, 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 it's not about gun control anymore. They've put gun control in place. It's about which uh, version of the law is better. Okay. Um, Mr. Brady, since you brought it up, we'll take the question about the 2000 prop measure that enabled citizens to keep ammunition. So the question says, how do you feel about individuals who bought large capacity magazines before 2000 no longer being exempt from the 2000 prop measure that allowed them to keep the ammunition? Well, I think I would answer a question with a question, which I know is annoying, but how would you feel if uh, property that you lawfully purchased years ago is all of a sudden made illegal because of the acts of others? I think that pretty much sums up my feelings. Uh, Law-abiding people, just to, uh, just to make clear for those who aren't really in the gun world and uh, know much about firearms, these so-called large capacity magazines, over 10 round magazines, are sold in every state in this union with the exception of three or four. They are what come standard with almost every handgun, uh, every semi-automatic handgun in the country. They are not more part particularly more dangerous than any other magazine. I know that people say, oh, they're used in, large, uh, in, in mass shootings and they, they result in more victims. It's been proven untrue because mass shooters normally bring multiple firearms with them. They don't need magazines. The most deadly school shooting, the Virginia Tech shooting, was all done with 10-round magazines. So it, it's just, it's a feel-good measure that says, oh, why do you need that? I think those of you, especially who are liberal-minded and think, you know, hey, I'm in a, I'm in a community that people don't understand, uh, I'm a minority, um, you might want to be a little careful about saying, well, those people do stuff that's different that I don't really care about or I don't like, so I'm going to infringe on what they want to do. All right, thank you, Mr. Brady. Mr. Rosen? It is true that California has uh, some of the strongest gun control laws in the nation. And it is also true that as a result of our strong gun laws, our gun death rate has been cut by nearly 60% over the last 10 years, much, much more than the reduction in that in other states that didn't have the strong gun control laws that we have. 
Sometimes there are things that are just too dangerous for one to possess as an individual, whether that's uh, a machine gun or a bazooka or a dirty bomb or magazines that have 15, 20, 25 rounds of ammunition in them. And living in a civil society means that we don't always get everything that we want whenever we want. Guns, as we know, are extremely dangerous. Guns are involved in more than 70% of the homicides in this country. The homicide, the murder rate in the United States is nine times higher than the murder rate in Western Europe. And the biggest reason for that is the proliferation of firearms in this country. This is a proposition which pragmatically, reasonably, seeks to remove guns and ammunition and magazines from the hands of people who should not have them. And for the vast majority of law-abiding gun owners, it Thank will not affect them Rosen, at all. That's all we have time for on that one. Um, another question for you both. Uh, do you feel that this type of ballot measure is indicative of a national sentiment towards gun ownership and control? Mr. Rosen, if you'd like to start. It's interesting uh, where we are in 2016. While there are more guns in America than there have ever been before, more than 300 million guns, almost one gun for every person in our country, uh, the number of individuals who own guns as a percentage of our population is much, much lower than it's ever been. In other words, uh, most people, the vast majority of people, don't have guns. A small number of people have many, many guns. And, uh, and for the small number of people that have many, many guns, a lot of them, perhaps most of them are law-abiding, but it's important for us to uh, have reasonable regulations to make sure that guns and ammunition and military-style weapons don't fall into the hands of the wrong people. Uh, when that happens, all of our safety is jeopardized. So I, I think that on the one hand, there's more guns than ever before, but it's much more concentrated than it's been in the past. I think that uh, we live in two different countries. Um, there are four or five states, California, New York, Connecticut, um, that are clamping down more than ever on firearms, and the rest of the country is going the other way, allowing people to carry firearms. Uh, concealed weapon permits have skyrocketed in the past 10 years without any of the shootouts over parking spaces that they uh, you know, predicted, that the naysayers, oh no, people are gonna be killing each other, or walking into, you know, toddlers are gonna have uh, handguns at uh, preschool. You know, all, all these doomsday proclamations never came true. CCWs are uh, in California, many of your neighboring counties uh, hand out CCWs as long as you can pass a background check. Is there a problem with uh, people from, you know, Fresno County or Sacramento County coming in and shooting the place up? No. Um, I want to address one point that uh, Mr. Rosen raised, and that's that California uh, it's, it's, cr it's uh, crime, violent crime has gone down 60% faster than the national average, uh, you know, in the past uh, 15, 20 years. That started in 1994. What happened in 1994? Three strikes law. Now, you may or may not be a proponent of three strikes law, and I'm not here to talk about it one way or the other. But what you can say is sorry, it's Mr. effective. Brady, that's all we have time for. Um, another question for you both. Since you brought up the uh, permits required to own guns and uh, ammunition, do you feel that there is appropriate infrastructure within the Department of Justice to handle any potential increase in permit checks for firearms and ammunition? <laughs> oh boy, where do I begin? Uh, the California Department of Justice Bureau of Firearms with its databases and uh, all the stuff it has to do is a nightmare. It, uh, its automated firearm system is, is a disaster. Any criminal defense attorney will attack that as soon as uh, it's used as evidence against one of their clients. 
um, which is all the more reason, you know, nobody really asked the California Department of Justice Bureau of Firearms, and I don't really think they can answer because it's a political question, but whether they want to be the administrators of this whole new ammunition database scheme for Proposition 63. And, and just to be clear, under the current law, there doesn't have to be a new bureaucracy created at the California Department of Justice. There doesn't need to be a database of all authorized ammunition purchasers. Proposition 63 requires that. Why do we need a whole new database of those authorized to purchase ammunition, especially when you have to apply to be in that database, pay $50, and wait up to 30 days? That's not necessary under current law. You go and you do an instant background check right there and get your ammunition and leave. Could you imagine if a, a young woman who's being threatened by her ex-boyfriend who's acting crazy goes in to purchase ammunition and they go, oh, sorry, uh, come back in 30 days and pay $50. Hopefully, hopefully you're still around. I mean, it's outrageous. We would never accept that in any other context, especially when it's unnecessary. The current law allows for an instant background check. What the law is putting into place, what Proposition 60 would put into place, would be a background check for ammunition in addition to for firearms. So to the extent that the California Department of Justice and Bureau of Firearms is tracking firearms, um, this is simply another point for them to track, which is ammunition. Uh, the other point I would just make that I, I think is important to understand is that while owning a handgun is, is your right, as long as you're not a, a felon, uh, and maybe it might make you feel good, make you feel strong, make you feel powerful, or you just you like having one, um, a gun in the home makes you much more likely, whether you're a man or a woman, if you're a woman, to be killed by your partner if there's a gun in the house, whether it belongs to you or your boyfriend or husband or your partner. You're in a much higher risk for suicide by gun as well. Guns take arguments that are maybe somewhat injurious and make them lethal. And so it's always important to understand that in terms of statistics, it's quite clear that you are more at risk if there's a gun in your house than if you are not, than if you don't have a gun in your house. Thank you. Uh, a final question for you both. In your professional opinion, do you think that this ballot measure, whether it passes or does not, is a gateway to further regulation of firearms in California and potentially further regulation of firearms across the nation? In terms of firearm regulation across the nation, I think it would be wise for other states in the country to follow California's lead in this regard. They don't have to. Every state, of course, is different. Uh, but uh, California, New York, Connecticut are states with lower gun violence because of stronger gun laws. and so. I think that would be something encouraging to other states. In terms of further firearm regulation in California, I'm not sure what the, the future holds. Uh, I think this is an important step in terms of having a very strong regulation in place. And I would just want the legislature to be able to provide the appropriate funding for law enforcement and the California Department of Justice to implement these laws. Because there's a little trick that organizations like the NRA play in Congress, which is they try to defund the organizations that go about and try to make sure that guns aren't in the hands of the wrong people. So it is important to have resources to be able to enforce the laws that are put in place, and Proposition 63 is a law that will help make us safer in our state. Thank you. Well, after this, I don't know how much more there is to regulate. I mean, we've got 10-day wait periods and background checks on firearms, now on ammunition, bans on possession of over 10-round magazines. I mean, I don't know what else they could possibly regulate, but I'm sure they'll find something. Um, but it's funny that uh, Mr. Rosen mentions that the NRA plays shenanigans with Congress. One provision in Prop 63, those who are ardent gun control supporters should be very concerned. Uh, it requires that California participate in the federal NICS program. Now, 
right now, California voluntarily does it, so I don't know why they want to force them to, but what if the NRA is successful in playing these shenanigans and convinces the feds to pass a law that says if you participate in the NICS program, you cannot have registration databases? Uh-oh. Bye-bye California's firearm databases. Bye-bye their registration system. Bye-bye the ammunition. So Proposition 63 is potentially a Trojan horse that leaves all of California's gun control in grave jeopardy. Um, as far as... Uh, uh, I, I want to end by saying about, you know, people uh, are more likely to be killed in their homes or whatever. Here in San Jose, years ago, there was a gay man by the name of Tom Palmer walking with his boyfriend down the street and was assaulted by a group of young thugs. He illegally pulled out a pistol and pointed it at the guys who were hitting his boyfriend. How, that could have ended up a lot differently had he not Mr. had a gun. Brady, I hate to interrupt, but that's all we have time for. Thank you both, and I'd like to pass it on to Adam Lee and Jade Griffith of Prop 62 and 66.